I saw that you were muted, but I don't hear anything. Does the hand up mean we're, we're good to go? <laughs> I hear you fine, Louise. Sorry, what did you say? Amy? Oh, I see the thumbs up. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, I just say it. I hear you. That's all. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I think we're ready to start. Um, welcome, everybody, to another Gazebo community meeting. Um, as always, these meetings get recorded and posted to YouTube. So if you have a problem with um, with you know you being recorded and, and uh, having your face recorded, uh, you can turn off your camera. Um, it's it's all up to you. So uh, today we're going to have two presentations. They're both about maritime projects inside Gazebo, uh, which is very exciting. And then um, we're going to uh, go over our usual agenda here. So um, you know, as always, uh, if people would uh, want to add their names to, to the attendees list here, you should have the link to the agenda on the uh, meeting announcement. So we can jump into the quick announcements here. Uh, it's gonna be five minutes of that, and then we're going to go into the two presentations. We're gonna start with the presentation about surface waves in Gazebo, and then another one about the multi lrav simulation. And then towards the end, if we have time, we can discuss other topics that people bring up, or you, know, you can keep asking questions to the speakers about their, their projects. So let's jump right in uh, for the announcements. Uh, this is just a repeat from last month, in case you missed it. Uh, Rust to Humble has been released, and it comes with uh, Gazebo Fortress uh, support. Gazebo 11, Gazebo Classic is also supported with Humble, uh, but we really recommend that you use Gazebo Fortress. Uh, and of course, you can use other combinations of uh, Gazebo with, with Rust if you compile from source. Uh, but you know you can read all about what's available to you in this announcement here. Um, another announcement is uh, some of the releases that came out since last month. So we had two release announcements. The first one here, uh, we had some minor releases for oops, for uh, Citadel and Fortress. So now we support uh, extruded polyline shapes. Uh, there is a nice. Um, option here to output JSON output when you're echoing a topic so you can process it with external tools more easily. There's an external plugin, uh, an, an elevator plugin that uh, was contributed by an external uh, contributor uh, that, is, that is very nice. Um, and then this other, uh, this other announcement here, uh, we got uh, bounding box cameras are available in Fortress now. Uh, so you know this is a, a, a sensor type that you can instantiate from from the simulator and just start using it. Uh, we also have now it's possible for you to see which plugins are loaded in the simulation uh, on directly on the component inspector, which is very handy for you to see what parameters are loaded and so on. Uh, we have a new triggered camera that takes photos instead of videos. Usually our cameras are just sending messages all the time, but this one is triggered by a topic, which can be useful in many situations. And also the the Extra the polylines is available in Fortress. The, the previous release had been only for Citadel. Uh, that's a summary of the latest releases. Uh, another thing that I'd like to point out for folks on Garden, and if you're developing features for Garden or if you're using Garden, uh, we're one month away from Feature Freeze. Uh, so Feature Freeze is going to be the end of July, and we're right now on June 29th, so uh, exactly one month from now, uh, we're going to be not accepting any new features into uh, Garden, which means that uh, all pull requests that are open with new features, they're either going to have to come into a minor release later, or if they are breaking, they're going to have to go into Gazebo H, the next release. Uh, so if you're developing a feature right now, be mindful of that date. And then we have other dates here for, for folks. You can see that our um, release schedule has changed uh, a lot from previous releases. If you follow previous releases before, it's more extended now. Uh, so we hope to be able to have more time for a tutorial party, more time for QA, and the actual release will be uh, at the end of September. So just some dates there if you're following the development of Garden. Another announcement related, related to Garden is, uh, as everyone is 
probably aware, we are renaming Ignition to Gazebo, and this is all happening in Garden. If people are uh, working with Garden right now, you may be seeing these changes coming up. Warnings are starting to show up in your development. Some things we're not being able to TikTok, and we're having to do hard changes. Uh, so just you know, if you want to follow the developments, we're tracking uh, all of the different things that are being updated here on this meta issue. If you want to uh, take a look at what changed and what's about to change. That's it for announcements. Um, so now I'm going to um, invite our, our first speaker to, to talk here today. Uh, Riz Mainwaring is has been developing uh, for Gazebo for a long time. He has some plugins for Gazebo Classic, for uh, the new Gazebo Fortress, and also uh, does a lot of work to make sure the Gazebo works on Mac OS, which are, we are very grateful for. Uh, and today he's going to be talking about uh, surface waves on Gazebo. So, Riz, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and you can share yours and take it away. OK, thank you, Luis. Let me just try and uh, see if I can bring the call into this, uh, this one here. Um, OK, apologies for that. Um, We can also swap it and do uh, Mitch uh, could speak first. If um, yes, I just uh, thought I had this all set up. And um, maybe if you do that, and I'll, uh, I'll come back later, if that's OK. Apologies, Louise. Oh, no problem, yeah. So I can introduce our other speaker, uh, which is Michel Hidalgo. He's uh, a close collaborator with us here at Open Robotics. He works at Ecumen in Argentina. And he's going to be talking about multi-LRAV simulation and Gazebo. Uh, and they're actually using Garden. Uh, so it's it's some exciting stuff. Mitch, uh, are you are you ready to jump in right now? I am, yes. Uh, I was polishing the, the presentation, but I can stop. <laughs> um, let me see. Uh, no, where are you? Uh, here it is. Um, uh, let me go full screen. Uh, no, that's not the right one. Uh, come on. Trying to uh, get the presentation to pop up. Okay, I put you on the spotlight suddenly there. Ah, uh, here it is. Oh, I see. Uh, Louise, if it's convenient, I can I can present from my other computer. I think that's all set up to go. Um, however you like. I, I, I can <laughs> we can stop again. Okay, do we is that visible now? Yeah, I can see I believe Riss presentation. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's 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 do that. So, Mitch, you have a little bit more time to polish, then, I guess. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just run with it like this, rather than try and try and expand it further. Um, that way, it's working. Um, okay. So, sorry for the mix-up there. Th this is a, a, a presentation is about um, some plugins that help support ocean waves and gazebo um, and an alternative approach to buoyancy and hydrodynamics. Um, so I originally developed these plugins for Gazebo Classic, Gazebo 11, um, and started doing some work for sailboats and Ross um, and then worked with ArduPilot to get um, some of the sort of support for watercraft from that um, that autopilot integrated in, in with it as well. Um, the, there's two main parts to it. There's the actual surface waves um, simulation, and then there's a, a set of plugins for um, the visuals on that. And then there's a hydrodynamics part, which includes the buoyancy calculations. Um, 
there's not really a lot new in the methods that are uh, applied. Um, the, the, the wave simulations have either come from things like the UV simulator or for the FFTs that have been developed a long time ago, um, sort of chiefly by Jerry Tessendorf, who, who developed them for films. Um, and then they've been adopted by various other games users and writers as well. Um, the water physics, uh, I've taken um, an approach uh, outlined by Jacques Kerner in a, a good blog series that he put together um, for a game that he, he was involved in developing. Um, so really the main contribution here is applying it to Gazebo, um, more recently extending it to the, um, the new render system um, in Gazebo Sim, um, and applying it to different types of vehicles. Um, so the overview, um, start by looking at the plugin library, um, and then there really a no formula in here. So I've provided references to all the details um, if people would like to look into the actual formula used and, and the, the arguments for various approximations. This is more of a, a spin through um, how, it's, how it's structured, and then a bit of a show and tell about how it works with some of the different, the different vehicles that we've applied it to. Um, so first of all, the, the plugin library, um, uh, the objectives that I was looking to do when putting this together was to provide a sea surface environment for marine vehicles um, that would allow the sea state to be configured in SDF and at runtime, rather than having to specify details about the, um, the, the sea state in, in the models themselves, in the vehicle models. So the simulation of the, of the, of the ocean is, um, and as far as possible, is like an environment, like specifying wind or other environment variables. And then the vehicle definition focuses on things about how it maybe has some of the hydrodynamics, damping Chris, and so on. Just yes? a quick question. Are you moving the, changing the slides? Because we're still just seeing the, the, oh, the first, with one? The first uh, one. Right. Yes, I am now. Sorry. Um, OK. Uh, so the, the overall structure of the of the library. We're still only seeing the, the first one, though. Oh, really? Yeah, we're seeing your browser, uh, the, the Google oh, Slides window. You know what? That's because I'm being daft and I'm, I'm using the wrong one. There you go. Now, now, okay. for now, now we're there. Right. OK, I've made it more complicated for myself than I need to. Um, yeah, so the, um, so, so the structure of the, the plugin libraries is there's really um, a part that's concerned with the waves, um, and that has got uh, the, the sort of the main main blue area concerns um, the simulation interface into generating the waves. And there's two different types of simulation: um, a trochoid simulation, which is very similar to the current methods that are available in Gazebo, um, and then um, a, a method that generates the waves using um, inverse FFTs from wave spectrum, um, and so that block is used um, both to generate the visuals um, and also generate the physics as well. Um, and on the client side, um, the visuals take the, um, the, the, the deflections from the simulation and apply them through the render pipeline into, into, the, into the screen. Um, there's also a little plugin, uh, a GUI plugin, which allows you to control some of the features of the waves. And, that publishes the parameters onto the messaging services, which then gets picked up both on the client and the server to keep them in sync. On the server side, um, the, the ocean tile um, doesn't have to generate quite so much information. It just has to do the displacements. Um, and then that's controlled by a, a, a wave field, which is component, which is then registered with the entity component manager so that when you have models which um, which uh, have a um, a plugin specifying some of the hydrodynamics details, that um, that plugin for the hydrodynamics can retrieve the wave field um, and query it via a sampler um, in order to obtain the, um, the the depth at various vertex points, and that's then used to construct um, a, a surface mesh and then determine. The, the depth of various vertex points on the model um, so that the buoyancy and hydrodynamics forces can be can be worked out. Um, so onto the waves. Um, the, the wave generation uh, that we're interested in, we, we really only need a, 
a time we need a time dependent CSIF, but we're not really interested in how the C state evolves. Um, so that would be quite a hard problem because you'd need to solve the, the issues of like energy transfer between waves and uh, between wind and waves, um, energy transfer between waves. That's not tackled at all in this in this uh, simulation. We're really just interested in a steady state spectrum. And so it's essentially a kinematic model. Um, I say it's been well studied and applied. Um, so all the details um, for formulas for the spectrum um, that we're using and the way that the FFT model is implemented can be found in various references. Uh, the one by Chris Mobley is really good because um, in order to get the, um, the simulation to actually match an ocean spectrum, you have to be really careful with the details and how the spectrum is used, whether it's a two-sided or one-sided spectrum, um, all the factors in the FFTs, and they differ according to the libraries that you're using. So a, a bit of care is required in order to, to make that work. Um, on the on, on the right hand side, there's a, a couple of GIFs running um, that that where I, I did a lot of the prototyping for this in Python using kind of simpler rendering engines just to get a view on what was going on. So this is using Panda 3D. Um, and it shows the trochoid waves at the top and uh, an FFT generated wave at the bottom. Um, and by having kind of various references that helped when when putting it into gazebo where quite a lot of the the challenge was actually just mapping the models into the the structures of of, of gazebo so it was finding a way way through the, the library to get that implemented um the the wave spectra um the again this is following um fairly standard references and so all, all the details are in here um the, the Spectrum I've used is um, from Ulfu uh, which is covers both the gravity and capillary waves. Um, the, we're only really able to sample a bit of the spectrum. Um, so here we're, we're looking at wave number versus the actual variance spectrum. Um, and because we're limited in the grid size, we have to choose the size of the sampling grid and the spacing quite carefully. Um, in order to to try and capture as much of the spectrum as possible, um, and depending on what we're trying to do, we're, we're probably interested in getting fairly long wave, sort of a decent decent size um, long wavelength. And if the grid spacing is is really fine, um, that's going to push up the the number of sample points. And if we're trying to run that in real time, that's going to be quite expensive. So. Um, we're not able to capture the full spectrum, but we can capture a reasonable amount. The other part that you need, if you want to have traveling rather than standing waves, is an asymmetric spreading function. So the, the variance is specified using polar coordinates. So there's a, a, a wave number sort of omnidirectional component to the spectrum. And then there's a spreading function which determines how that's distributed um, in, in terms of the, the downwind part of the waves versus everywhere else. And so this uh, cosine 2s spreading function is the one that's used. Now, you can plug in different types of spectra if you wish to, um, but these were sufficient for what we're doing. Um, the, the wave surface then is generated by inverting um, the spectrum via a Fourier transform into a surface elevation map. Um, so the, the, the spectrum is randomly sampled. Um, care needs to be taken so that the Fourier amplitudes are Hermitian, um, so that you wind up with a real surface. And then time evolution is dealt with by adding a time-dependent phase factor, um, which means that you don't have to calculate all the, all the amplitudes each update step, and you just need to multiply three by a phase factor. Um, this depends on the dispersion model that's used for the waves. Um, I've just used a deep water dispersion. Um, extensions might be to take into account depth to adjust the wave speed as you hit shallow water. Um, in order to, oops, excuse me, in order to get um, waves that have a slightly steeper wave phase, um, and this is similar to the way that the trochoid waves are put together, there's also surface displacement. So the uh, FFTs are used to displace both um, the, the elevation of the waves and also a horizontal movement. Um, and then finally, for 
uh, the visuals, you also need the surface tangents. Um, and this is used for calculating things like bump maps um, in order to provide a, a, a more definition on the wave surface and visualization. That's not required when, when looking at the, um, the, the, the basic physics. It's just used in the, in the visuals. So there's quite a lot of calculation going on behind the scenes. Um, in the hydrodynamics, um, there's uh, the kind of trick here, and this is this is really all Kerner's work, um, is the calculation uses rather than a volumetric calculation, it uses the surface of the of the mesh. Um, so a simplified triangulation of the mesh is provided, and then each triangle in the mesh is analyzed to see where it intersects with the the sea surface, um, and then the focus is on calculating the pressure and various hydrodynamic drag forces for each of the submerged triangles. Um, so on, on the diagram from Kerner's paper, you can see that as a triangle intersects the wave surface, you, you wind up with a larger and larger portion of it, which is submerged. Uh, there's a cutting algorithm to allocate the triangles that are submerged, and then that gets passed on to the calculations. Um, the hydrodynamic forces um, are really quite approximate in the way that uh, it's not a full fluid dynamics model. Um, there, are, there, are, there are some drag forces with two different types of drag forces, which I've included in this, that look at the um, local velocity of the triangle through the fluid um, and then calculate the effect of uh, viscous drag and then some normal components on the, on the triangle as well. So all of these forces are then summed up and applied uh, as a force and torque at the uh, center of mass of the link for which these triangles are associated. Um, in order to get it to work in anything like a real amount of time, um, you need to uh, simplify the collision meshes. Um, so this is the, the sort of gazebo duck which is used in some of the examples. Um, so things you need to do, uh, remove um, first of all, it needs to be a watertight volume um, so that you, you have a closed surface. Um, you, you remove decorative features which aren't all that important for the, for the buoyancy and, and physics. Um, and then there's a decimation modifier available in Blender which you can use to reduce the vertex count. So depending on the model that you've got, um, it can be more or less work to prepare the collision meshes. Um, and then once that's done, you can have a little look at at how how well it's behaving. So this is on an earlier version from Gazebo 11. Um, so the hydrodynamic parameters um, are tuned to provide something that looks like a real damping force. At the moment, there's no general method to calibrate or fit them. Um, so it is a little bit by eye. And for, um, for, for vehicles which have things like fins and rudders, um, the hydrodynamics forces aren't sufficient on these to really provide the desired dynamics, so um, a modification to the drag plugin um, for things like sailboats and, and rudders has um, has been developed as well uh, to provide the additional forces needed to, to get those types of models to work correctly. Um, the visuals, um, so, sorry, the original, original methods used uh, sinusoidal trochoid waves, and these um, have been used in um, things like the, the currently available models in, um, in Gazebo. Uh, the visuals all use displacements in the vertex shader, and there's no real passing of, of the, the, the displacements um, into, into the GPU from the CPU. Um, the, the, the lighting is dealt with in a custom shader, which deals with things like normal mapping, environment mapping, um, for, for getting reflections of the the sky um, and uh, a Fresnel adjustment to get water depth versus reflections. Um, it's very fast, uh, but at the moment there's no tiling and large meshes need to use, um, are either quite expensive to run or need to use a lower resolution, um, for example, in the, in the coast model. Um, so in the, the visual plugin developed here, um, there's a custom plugin for the wave visuals. Um, at the moment, the FFT model is not implemented on the GPU, so the, the displacements need to be passed from the calculation where the FFT is evaluated on the CPU into the GPU. 
And there's really two methods that I've used in Gazebo Sim to do this. One of them is dynamic geometry, and the other one is with textures. Um, and I had a bit more on that somewhere else. Um, I seem to have dropped the slide. OK. Um, so basically, one way is to, to perturb the vertices um, and then pass those vertices into the GPU. Um, the other way is to create some texture maps and perturb those and pass those in um, and, and update textures rather than the actual vertex geometry. And there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, I think in the long term, dynamic textures is probably the way to go. And the reason for that is that um, you're able to then tile very large oceans quite efficiently. Um, and I think that may lend um, uh, to an approach uh, using something like the Terra plugin um, that or that the that which is a custom HLMS shader, and that might be a better way of doing it. At the moment, um, it can't use um, the PBS rendering when 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 we're doing that. Um, yeah, how am I going to get that to play? Uh, okay, that's maybe a little frustrating. Um, what I'd hope to show here is that. If I, okay, I'll skip over that for running out of time. Um, but with the dynamic textures, it's possible to create very large maps of the ocean. Um, so many, many kilometers square um, without degrading the rendering performance too much. Okay, so the next part of the, the talk really focuses on different types of surface vehicle um, that has been applied to well. So I'll, I'll quickly skim through these. Um, so the first one is the, the WAMV, which is used um, in the VRX. Uh, so that model required um, a little bit of preparation in order to be able to be used, uh, mostly simplifying um, the surface meshes on the pontoons and the platform. Um, and we can see here that um, each, e e each Part of the model, each link in the model has an associated patch of water, um, which is a which is then a projection of the wave surface onto a smaller grid, uh, and that's used for a, a fast lookup. So for each vertex that's in the collision mesh, we need to uh, find the height, and so we sample the wave field in the local area of of the vehicle in order to to do that. Um, and you can see that. Um, as you as you examine the model and switch on some of the markers, you can you can see the underwater surface and the water line on the collision mesh. So this is the part of the mesh that is used for the buoyancy calculation. As the model moves around or as the waves pass over the model, then this changes dynamically. Um, with this model, um, again, is there any way to? I'm not sure why I can't get it to play. In, uh, it's because I haven't got it in full presentation mode. Um, okay. Right. Now we'll skip through that. Um, so I've uh, integrated this model with ArduPilot using um, the the Argy, um, ArduPilot plugin, um, and that gives you. Um, a variety of control methods. In this case, uh, with the two motors, we've just used a, a set it up as a rover with vectored thrust. Um, so, without having to do a great deal of additional work, you have uh, control models um, for autonomous um, control of of of, of the vehicle. Um, okay. Other vehicles. Um, so sailboats. Um, an application which we did in, uh, for Gazebo 11 um, is, a, is a, a small model sailboat. Um, again, these are models for, that you, you can do simulations for and, and have the physical devices available as well. Um, so this is a, a, a model developed by Brian Helwert from New Zealand, um, who kindly uh, gave me permission to use his CAD models um, and, and publish them in um, in the repo that contains this this model and the examples. Um, again, the collision meshes are simplified. Uh, the fins are dealt with separately, and as mentioned before, there's there's lift and drag applied to the fins. Um, so 
there's a there's a collection of plugins for dealing with the the lift on the foils, lift on the sails. Um, and so the main difference between these plugins and the standard lift drag plugins is that there's a adjustment for the free stream velocity of the fluid uh, and some additional custom messages for debugging just to make sure that the um, the forces are being applied where we want them. Um, that could all be integrated back into the, the core plugins, I, I imagine. Um, then for automating, um, you need to have an anemometer. So there's an additional sensor to provide wind data, again, dealing with the, the relative motion of the boat through the, through the, the water and the air. And um, these need to be migrated to Gazebo Sim. They're currently only available in the classic version. And once again, um, with this model, there's a, a, a version of Rover with um, control for sail trim that takes anemometer data and you can automate the, the, the model using Arduino Pilot. Um, and in this case, there's a, a Docker image as well um, that uh, was, a, was originally put together when there was some thought about running a vir virtual version of one of the sailing competitions. And that didn't come to much, but the, the Docker image was there. Um, a more recent application of this um, was done uh, in conjunction with some of the Arduino pilot devs, uh, they were interested in landing um, large quad planes on ships. Um, so the target vehicle in this case was an ultra-transition quad plane. So it's a sort of relatively large drone, about three meters wingspan. Um, and we were trying to put it on the back of a, of a large vessel. So in this case, we just used a model of a, of a, um, of a, of a research ship with a relatively large platform. Um, the main thing to note here is that the, the vehicle has scales that are, are quite different um, when it comes to dealing with water physics. Now, I haven't got it completely tuned for this um, because we're dealing with quite a large vehicle with a very large mass compared to some of the smaller drones. And it, currently the hydrodynamics approximations are not scaling particularly well for, for this. Um, it needs a little bit more tuning and I think the actual control in Arduino Pilot needs a little bit more tuning as well. Um, but it was it was used um, to, um, to to do some final testing on uh, the Lua plugin that was developed for Arduino Pilot Plane 4.2. Um, Andrew Trigel gave quite a detailed presentation at this year's conference of, of how it was all put together. Um, and there's quite a nice video here if I can maybe um, publish this so people can look through it rather than me um, try and get it to run now. Um, but you have like a takeoff and landing. Um, the, the benefit of having a moving sea surface here is that the deck on the ship is moving as well as the ship is moving. they normally relatively slow velocity, so about no more than about five meters per second for these examples on, on the ship. Um, but that affects the sort of takeoff and land, plus also also the, the 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 follow scripts and the automatic landing scripts. So that's quite a nice application of of using the the wave surfaces. Um, you can run with submersibles as well. Um, uh, again, Chris, um, if you could wrap up in like a couple of minutes, it, yep. it would be nice to, to give enough time to Mitch. Certainly. OK, so I'll skip through that. Um, so there's been an application to like a blue ROV. And then most recently, um, I've applied it to the MBARI wave boy as well. Um, and that was quite useful because it uncovered some details about applying the, the hydrodynamics force is at, at the correct places. Um, so there's there's further work to do. Um, there's more information on the wave generation, improved physics, uh, optimization will always be welcome. and there's probably quite a lot of work to do to do with very large scale sea surfaces um, by looking at perhaps a, a, a terra style custom HLMS uh, for that. Um, and then uh, for those interested, there's more details and, and references and so on. Okay, so that's it from me. Thank you, Rez. That was very nice. That's very advanced usage of gazebo when it comes to shaders, markers on the GUI, the physics. Uh, that, that's pretty impressive work. I'm going to skip on the questions for now so we can give Mitch time for his presentation, and then we can have everybody ask questions to the both of you at the end if we have time. Sounds good? 
so Riz, if you can uh, share your screen and then Mitch can share and take over. There we go. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes and yes. Great, amazing. All right, so thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, this talk is entirely about uh, multi LRV simulation. Um, this is um, a project that's been going on uh, for over a year uh, between Nambari and OSRC, uh, and fairly recently uh, I got on board. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, uh, an engineer, software engineer from Acumen, uh, an Argentina-based company uh, that is a close partner of OSRC, and has been a close partner of OSRC for the past uh, several years. So first and foremost, why? Um, conducting oceanographic research uh, at sea, at scale, over long periods of time is not only challenging, but really expensive. Um, Fleets of long-range AUVs, that, that, that's what LRV stands for, uh, pose a major opportunity uh, to enable this kind of research uh, in a cost-effective way, but deploying this is still costly. Uh, development cycles are usually long, and public domain resources, open source tools uh, are only now starting to catch up. So it's still a, a challenge on itself. So essentially, robotics is hard. We all know that, but robotics at sea, it's usually harder. So the Monterey uh, Bay Aquarium Research Institute, MBARI, that Rhys uh, already mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, set sail on a journey with, with OSRC uh, in early 2021. Uh, and I took this verbatim from them. Uh, the goals were essentially to create a multi LRV simulation tool that can allow researchers uh, to iterate and validate multi-vehicle algorithms. Uh, and on a second note, uh, to contribute back to the maritime, to the emerging maritime robotics community, uh, and enable cross pollination, and, and essentially make it easier for everyone, not only those uh, at Embari, uh, to uh, apply and validate uh, advanced methods uh, of ocean observation. Um, it's not just me, uh, so it's good to put credit where it, where it belongs. Uh, it's a team of people. Um, most of them uh, are. Uh, are here in the talk uh, and in the Bay Area, uh, except for a few uh, odd ones. Uh, and as I told you before, this has been going for uh, over a year, almost a year and a half. Uh, we are on the uh, perhaps the last semester, uh, at least for this project. Uh, and you may be able to find all the uh, the current code and the state of affairs over at OSRF, OSRF LRV on GitHub. Uh, still, this is a working in progress. So, going to the details, um, the vehicle geometry that this was uh, like a full digital twin of the Ambaris 30 LRV uh, as we made available over our fuel. Uh, the model includes uh, meshes, uh, hull fins, and propeller meshes uh, that are both both used for visual and collision geometries. Um, frame conventions are, uh, well, uh, for the people here, perhaps it's not, not news, but uh, they don't tend to, uh, maritime robotics uh, or maritime systems don't tend to follow the typical ANU conventions that are uh, so common uh, to us folks in their uh, terrestrial robotics uh, scene. Uh, so uh, this LRV follows, uses an FSK, uh, frame uh, for uh, an FSK body frame and a typical NED frame for for the global, global reference frame, and all the sensors have been uh, accommodated uh, to to comply with this. Uh, vehicle dynamics. Uh, so um, as of today, uh, the system dynamics are implemented on an otherwise uh, rigid body physics engine. Of, simply by modeling the forces and moments. Uh, uh, starting off, uh, or, or, or the, the, the usual uh, rigid body mechanics uh, model, uh, 
we've uh, included uh, an upstream to some extent uh, plugins that can model uh, hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic uh, buoyant and environmental forces. Um, for hydrodynamic dynamic forces, uh, we're basically modeling them, modeling them after the simplest of Fosen's uh, linearized equations for underwater vehicles, including added mass, Coriolis, and dumping. Uh, lift and drag uh, to the water fluid are also uh, are also modeled. Um, for restoring forces, uh, we are not only computing the uh, buoyant uh, forces in a, homo in a homogeneous uh, fluid density layer, that of water, but we are also dealing with uh, the interface uh, with the air. And for environmental forces, um, we essentially grabbed uh, the, the stock uh, wind effects plugging and we made it so uh, in a way that we can, in a way that allows us to model a piecewise uh, field of low pass filter sinuso sinusoidal fluctuations plus uh, noise. It's still a rather uh, oversimplification of what's going on, but it, but it's so far it's it's has been good for our purposes and for functional uh, testing in general. So, for actuators, uh, typical fins uh, for rudder uh, and elevation, uh, the propeller for thrusting, uh, a, moth, a battery mass shifter so that we can uh, perform pitch control, uh, a drop weight as a detachable joint uh, for emergency surfacing, and a variable buoyancy system, essentially a, uh, an oil bladder that can be, uh, uh, whose volume can be uh, adjusted uh, for depth control. For sensors, uh, essentially, uh, well, we have a few. Uh, those that aid navigation and, and AHERS that has been modeled after Spadron's AHRS M2 uh, for Thetis. Uh, and it's basically repurposing the existing IMU magnetometer, uh, accounting for the uh, for the differences in frames. Uh, at the bottom, tracking uh, tracking DVL is actually um, it's actually using, or, or it's the first instance that I know of uh, of a custom rendering sensor uh, written outside of the gazebo seam rendering tree. Uh, it, it estimates uh, sensor velocity with respect to the bottom in an in a starboard uh, forward mast frame, uh, and it's implemented essentially with the depth camera uh, that's performing ray casting using the GPU to speed up uh, processing, uh, and then um, querying the, the the physics engine, determining uh, the, uh, between the velocities, uh, computing the projections of those velocities uh, on, onto the direction of the vector that would uh, uh, correspond to the reflection, uh, and then performing a least square computation uh, to retrieve the velocity. Uh, this sensor has also been configured uh, to uh, uh, mimic a teledyne or the iPad finder, that is a four beam uh, phased array arrangement. Uh, I think, yeah, that, that, that's, that's about it. Um, these LREVs, the, the LREVs that Embari has been working on for several years, uh, carry uh, a bit of a small lab on them. Uh, uh, we've modeled uh, uh, this, uh, a CDD and a fluorometer sensor, which essentially uh, is able to pick up uh, chlorophyll, salinity, temperature, and water current speed samples. Um, these samples uh, are actually real-world measurements that are provided to the simulator uh, uh, as 4D uh, gridded data uh, that we can then uh, interpolate uh, in space and time. Uh, and well, uh, the, the basic idea is uh, we can then use controllers to track some of these quantities uh, while navigating, which is what uh, we'll eventually do, what the other we will, uh, will actually do in the field. Uh, for acoustic communication, so we, we have a relatively simple uh, message passing mechanism uh, over a rather simplified acoustic channel uh, that uh, so far uh, models transmission loss and propagation velocity. And on top of this uh, uh, communication channel, we have also a rather simplified implementation of an USVL that can track 
range azimuth and inclination between acoustic transponders, enabling uh, some of the uh, acoustic tracking applications that are relevant and meaningful for various research. Uh, this particular sensor was modeled again, uh, <laughs> uh, like uh, the ones before after uh, a teleline sensor, a teleline benthostat uh, sensor. So, uh, moving on from the vehicle and into the environment, uh, we are leveraging uh, digital elevation map DM support uh, in Gazebo uh, to load real world bathymetry uh, that was picked up by, by uh, MRS LRV uh, over at the Portuguese Ledge State Marine Conservation Area off the coast of uh, uh, California. Um, in, in particular, uh, one point worth mentioning is that um, the digital elevation map support that uh, uh, Gazebo Garden currently has uh, enables, uh, uh, has, le has uh, level support so that uh, different tiles of the digital elevation map can be uh, loaded into a simulation to uh, to lower uh, the burden on the, on the hardware as it simulates. Uh, for user interfaces um, and programming interfaces, uh, so all of all uh, actuators and sensors uh, expose uh, uh, guess your transport topic based interface. Uh, there are all there are also means to spawn uh, new vehicles dynamically and track the actual simulation state as ground truth uh, uh, through these uh, same means. But in addition, uh, a few uh, GUI plugins uh, provide, for convenience, uh, access to some of this some of this uh, functionality uh, at the release for for VC demonstration. And a minor minor note on maritime robotics interfaces: we know that uh, there are ongoing efforts towards standardizing them. Uh, they are not. Or, or, or to the best of our knowledge, they are not quite there yet. Uh, not in Gazebo, not in Ross. Uh, hopefully, they, they will soon be. Uh, but in in an intent, uh, or it is our intent to contribute to that to those efforts. And therefore, we've ensured that all the interfaces that we use uh, are either um, uh, chosen or crafted uh, in a way that it's general enough to not only support the current uh, needs of Ambari, but also those of uh, who might come uh, after. Performance. Performance is a, it's a very important aspect of this endeavor. Uh, high speed simulation is a bit of a prerequisite uh, to enable faster iterations. Uh, the typical missions that Ambari runs in the field. Uh, and that may well span uh, hundreds of kilometers uh, over hours or even days uh, are not really don't lend themselves that well uh, for to quick uh, quick iteration of a new algorithm. Uh, so simulation must run with an R, with, with an RTF or a real time factor well over one. Uh, I run some. A small benchmark on my computer, which is not a very beefy computer, but it's perhaps representative of what uh, uh, a typical software engineer out there may have uh, at hand. Uh, and we are well over 10x, uh, even reaching uh, 20x. And that's even considering that my computer was rather loaded and it even throttled the CPU uh, quite a bit uh, at some point. Uh, having said that, much higher RTF uh, real-time factors can be achieved on, on better hardware. Uh, in this particular instance, I think uh, we were nearing 100. Uh, and for a demonstration, this is, um, this is a, uh, a mission that the Mbari folks uh, were uh, kind enough uh, to share a video of. Uh, this is a multi-vehicle uh, targeted chlorophyll uh, sampling mission uh, that it's 
uh, using both the multi-LRV simulation environment and uh, Embari's proprietary LRV controller. Uh, that, that LRV controller and so that, that, that controller is available, uh, not the sources, but the executables. Uh, that's not, so this particular, uh, while the controller is available, this particular mission, uh, I believe it's not. Uh, having said that, uh, nothing prevents anyone from uh, rolling out the raw controllers. Uh, the Are you trying to play the video, Mitch? Because we, we don't see the video. No, not yet, no, no, not yet. Ah, okay. uh, I, I was talking about uh, what the mission is about, uh, but yeah, we can, <laughs> uh, it looks like uh, people want to see. Uh, let me see if I can uh, uh, go full screen. So what, what you're going to see here is uh, at first two vehicles describing a, yo a so-called yo-yo trajectory. Uh, that is a circular trajectory with a given depth and altitude envelope. Uh, and at some point, uh, one of the vehicles, the first vehicle, the one with a blue path, will start tracking chlorophyll. Uh, let me see what time it gets to that point. Uh, there we go. This particular demonstration doesn't have the Portuguese ledge loaded, uh, but it's uh, it, it will be a minor uh, addition of the most of the functionality uh, necessary to pull this off is already there. Uh, and you can see, I'll speed this up a little bit, how while the other one keeps tracking the same area, surrounding the same area, uh, the first vehicle stays on course. And I think that's about it. Uh, oh, right, almost right on time. Uh, any questions? Uh, and again, thank you for, for coming. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mitch. Those were very polished slides. Uh, yeah, thank you for, for taking the time and presenting the, a lot of cool stuff going on. Yeah, I'd like to open the floor for questions for both speakers right now. Um, anyone? Yuri, go ahead. Hey, uh, yeah, first, uh, I mean, it was very, very nice, the presentation, all the work. I have tried the, the long range uh, simulations, very nice. I'm very excited to try as well the, the, the simulation, the plugins that Riz showed. And actually, I have a question about it. Um, for me, it wasn't, I, I mean, I didn't, I see that it simulates the, the drag and also the buoyancy, but doesn't compute Anything related to the added mass of the vehicle or something? I didn't get that. No, no, no that that can be added in, um, but there isn't an added mass um, contribution in the in, in the simulation at the moment. Hmm. So you, okay. you, could, you could use the existing added mass plugin if you wanted to do that, and you can disable the hydrodynamics and just leave the buoyancy. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll try that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, you know, regarding added mass, I'll just point out that we do have um, a proposal open to add native support to added mass to the SD format. Um, we're uh, actually going to be talking about it in the maritime working group meeting next week for folks who are interested, the Ross maritime working group meeting. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Right. So, um, do you know what the performance is right right now with the new approach compared to the old one? Uh, despite there are still future improvements that need to be done. Um, it's it's about um, com compared to the the previous wave simulation or the one for um, that's currently available in Gazebo using oh, compared the to the one that's currently available. Oh, 
it, it's it's quite a bit more expensive so um and that's that's because you have the the, the wave surfaces to generate plus the lookup and the the current simulation um all the calculation for the wave generation is done on the gpu for the visualization um where in in my my plugins at the moment the the visualization um calculations are done on the cpu and then the updates are pushed through um it so it it, it won't compare in terms of performance um so i i think if you're looking for something like 10 times acceleration or 10 times real time factor you you would struggle at the moment um but i i think with with improvements and moving some of the calculation onto the gpu you, you could get some of it back um but it's going to be more expensive than than the current the current approach Yep, sure. Um, I just have another question. So you also show that you have to decimate and simplify the mesh, I guess, for performance uh, reasons. Are you just doing that to the visual side of things, or is it just um, can you keep the high quality visual and just use a simplified model for? Uh, no, that's, that, that's right. So the collision meshes in Gazebo are, are separate from the visual, so you can you can keep the high definition visuals, and um, for. For complicated shapes, um, you, you might want to simplify the collision mesh. Um, for, for, for fairly straightforward shapes, you can use the gazebo primitives as you, as you might for a, for a standard vehicle as well. So just um, cylinders or capsules and other, other forms like that. Cool. Thanks. Anyone else? Sina, you're up. Yes, uh, I have a question for Michelle. Uh, so, is how generic this uh, model and the dynamics is? Is it uh, is it extendable to let's say more actuators, different shapes, and things like that? Is is it using physics engine for dynamics, or the equation you showed? Is are you guys doing the calculation separately? Okay, those are all those are good questions. So, um, extendability uh, for the most part. Uh, the, uh, the the simulator is let's say um, a use case of Gazebo Garden on asteroids. Uh, many of the things I mentioned uh, during the presentation have been upstream over the course of a year or a year and a half, uh, and more will come eventually. Uh, mm, we expect most of it uh, to be available upstream uh, for this simulator and for any other. Uh, so it's as extensible as Gazebo is. Uh, and uh, about uh, how the dynamics are implemented. So uh, like I said uh, halfway through the presentation, um, what we do is we model uh, the effects of buoyancy, of uh, hydrodynamic dynamic damping of added mass as uh, forces and moments separate from the simulator uh, and then feed them back. Uh, so uh, while, uh, like Luis said, uh, there is an ongoing effort towards uh, incorporating added mass uh, to the uh, to the simulator itself, uh, so that uh, we can leverage uh, uh, I don't know the RK3, RK4 uh, integrators that are being used uh, within. That's not the case right now uh, for the simulator, uh, given the current state of affairs. It might. Uh, in, in the coming months. Thank you. But just one more thing to, to add. Um, so all the plugins that that Mitch has presented are generic. So the only thing you need to do, I mean, the only, it, it's a very hard problem, but it's all based on parameters. So the main thing is that you will need to find the right set of parameters for your model. But if you have that, then in theory, everything should work. That's great, thanks. Thank you, everyone. So we are on time. Um, so I'd like to wrap up the uh, meeting here. Um, thank you again to both our speakers. And I invite everybody to join our next community meeting a month from now uh, in the end of July uh, with new talks. And you know, let's follow up on, on these projects. Uh, Rhys said that he has a post on, on Gazebo community to talk about the waves. And Mitch pointed out to the LRV repository. Uh, I'm sure people can follow up there. So thank you, everyone. See you next month. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.